Now I want to move on to our uh, next pillar around customers and value chains. And our next keynote is our volatile planet, what does this mean for Australian agriculture? And I wel welcome up Dr. Cheryl Kalish Gordon, the Head of Strategy at Rabobank ANZ. Uh, Dr. Gordon is an economist who's made a career supporting decision making in the food, agriculture and natural resources sector. A consultant to business and government for almost a decade and her early career followed by time as a lecturer at the University of Sydney, then as a trade and economics manager for grain growers in the latter role responsible for advocating, evaluating and negotiating global and regional trade positions on behalf of the Australian Government. Uh, Dr Gordon has, has a PhD in economics and grew up on a cropping property in central New South Wales, not far from her home now near Orange, where she lives with her husband and three kids. Please make her welcome. I do need to adjust the mic. <laughs> Thank you to the NFF for the invitation. Thank you for, again, providing the forum for many of Australia's great minds in agriculture to come together um, to talk about the big issues and the things that we need to bring along together as a sector. Thank you also to um, Charlie, um, Tony and Fiona for the program, which allows me to now bring a build on what was talked to uh, uh, this morning about the volatility that we have seen in 2022 and where to next um, from that. All right. So this is a pretty um, distressing view of the world to be looking at. But it's fair to say this is how I feel and many people feel at the moment when we are play facing ever increasing prices and volatility on those prices, ever increasing inflation, a new and perhaps uh, record, in most cases, uh, natural disaster event every other week, global tensions and flashpoints, and talk of nuclear weapons being engaged. In the commodity market, we've seen certainly this and the need to get ready for anything that that fractured world is presenting. Over this year, we have indeed seen the volatility that was spoken of by um, Fiona and Tony. We've seen prices that have ranged upwards to 120% above where they were at the beginning of the year, downwards to uh, close to 40% on the downside, and that's at high levels, given we already entered the year in a high pricing environment. That hasn't all been bad for Australian ag, of course. We peaked in terms of the Australian, or the uh, Rabobank Rural Commodity Price Index in the middle of the year. We have come back from that, a lot due to our own uh, good fortune in production, but we are still on trend with high pricing coinciding with a magnificent year of production in most regions. It's not often that I'd be able to present you a grains picture which shows, and please check the legend, that 300 is at the bottom on the left-hand side. Grain pricing not even coming close to what we call the magic number for wheat prices um, over the course of this year when we're on the back of record production. So we've had strong prices and excellent or good to excellent production across most of the country. So what of next year? If we look around the world, we are looking at a, an outlook that is characterised by low stocks, particularly in exporting nations, um, the likes of the US, Canada, the EU, high costs of inputs and across the board in the consumer complex, especially in the EU and the US, as well as here in Australia. Uncertainty in terms of resupply of those balance sheets across the agri-complex. Uh, Notably, Argentina has got downgrades. We're still looking at concerns about what's happening with the winter wheat crop across North America. There are no set uh, return to supply prospects across the year ahead. Brazil looks good. Ukraine looks um, on the downside, as you would expect. There's so we're looking at some prospects for resupply, but nothing certain. Those three elements, being low stocks, high uncertainty, high costs, are going to help maintain higher prices over the course of 2023. But it's going to be balanced by slowing economic growth, brought on by higher inflation, 
the impacts of that. Higher interest rates and sl uh, the COVID-induced slowdowns you know, across a key market like China. So on the whole, we're looking at a, a, a bearish picture, but remembering that we're coming from heights. We still expect that by the end of, you know, during 2023, that we will be trading at historically high prices across the global complex because of the factors that I've mentioned. But we will expect that that's going to be disproportionately impacting some of our commodities if we looked more closely. Something like wheat, a staple, and a uh, staple of Australian exports around the world, is going to hold firm. This global outlook of low stocks and lower purchasing capacity supports a strong wheat market, less so for discretionary items like cotton and wool products. But of course, commodity prices are all relative to costs. We have seen the costs move high and be volatile across 2022 in exactly the same way that we have seen commodity output prices. And of course, this has stretched margins. We've already seen that come to bear, especially for those that have just planted this year their most expensive crop on record and potentially lost some or all of it in flooding. So the outlook for 2023, high prices continuing, a little bit down on where we've been, but historically high, but a margin squeeze giving the, bear, the uh, bearance of ongoing high input costs, especially with a uh, soft dollar continuing. So it would be all very well and good, however, and very tempting to blame all of this volatility and the concerns we've just talked about this morning on the culprits of COVID, Russia, <laughs> floods across the world in far off places like Pakistan and nearer to home, like in my poor hometown of Forbes. It'd be very tempting to blame all of this on that and then plan for back, getting back to normal. However, that would be to treat them as events rather than symptoms of structural change in how our globe is operating. The Ukraine war fits squarely in a fracturing that has been coming for some time. The global challenge to the Western-led uh, institutions that have served us so well over the past 30 years in particular, and certainly throughout my lifetime as an economist, are being challenged. This fits squarely within this structural trend. And the extreme ver climate variability fits squarely within the expected trends of global warming. The destabilisation of our weather systems around the world, the destabilisation of our production bases. And so what I would uh, conjecture is that what we have seen over the last couple of years is not events, but rather an early insight in what happens when these trends, deglobalisation and destabilisation of climates over time come to bear and develop and what happens when push comes to shove. COVID may or may not be part of the, uh, the global uh, pushing of the boundaries on the climate, but it certainly has acted in this case as a catalyst to helping us see an insight into the future of these developing fracturing trends. So when we see what happens when push comes to shove, and we've seen it over the past year or so, we see the engagement of and weaponisation of trade um, as part of the global power construct. We've seen countries over uh, react in a way to serve their domestic purposes. We've seen tariffs, quotas, go slows. We've seen people working in their personal or home interests and much less with a global agenda. And what that tells you is that you need to be thinking about into the future with an, a, when push comes to shove of working with your friends. So who are Australia's friends? If we look at the globe, there are the obvious candidates. There's the, uh, the AUKUS partners, the Quad partners, the NATO alliance. And of course, they're, they're, fairly, um, they're fairly obvious when we put them on a map. 
Less obvious are some of the relations you might see across the globe um, that bear in red that might be a different um, trading block. But there's a whole lot of grey in the middle, or orange in this case, of parts of the world that won't necessarily be in a position to be able to afford to choose which side of the ledger they fall as push comes to shove. I've overlaid this with our current um, export program and there's some telling um, insights into what this means for our global trade outlook. Firstly, if we take a large current export partner out of the frame, it's certainly quite striking here as to how much we have to increase our exports across the rest of our major partners. So one, we need to divert to other parts of the world. We need to expand and grow those relationships. But not only that, we need to consider what those countries will want. And if I overlay the uh, sustainability goals of those countries that fall into the export destinations that will easily choose to fall into Australia's friend camp when push comes to shove, you'll find that a vast majority of them have climate goals that are superior to or more advanced than our existing set of exports, primarily that of China. So we need to be greener when we look at how we approach trade across the next wee while as push comes to shove. Similarly, we can overlay that with the costs of living in these countries as a proxy for costs of production. And if you overlay that, we see that the countries that we would be moving to or aligning with are more expensive to produce in. The cost of living across these nations is higher than China for the most part. So what does this all mean for ag? Well, certainly a margin squeeze in 2023. We've absolutely seen that coming to bear already, sadly, for parts of the East Coast. 2023 and beyond. We're going to see a more risky global playing field. We're going to see greater price volatility. We're going to see the likelihood of the need to trade with friends rather than in the most efficient supply chains. We're going to have higher input prices whether that's because we're um, taking the risky approach and we are uh, having higher inventories of uh, key inputs or we're onshoring or buying them from high, more expensive um, production regions. And we do need the need, we do need to be prepared to be greener. But we're still in a sector with a strong outlook. If we look at the globe, there is still a calorie deficit globally. The world needs our production. We are in a good position. So what does this all mean? It means we don't expect a return to normal. We do need to expand and develop our friend group. We've done pretty well with that as push has come to shove over the last couple of years. But what this means is that we don't take those markets that we have moved to for granted. We do need to be greener, both because of the uh, challenges on the environment, but also because our markets will expect it. We do need to be more judicious with our imports, both because that will help us be greener, but also because we are import, rel import reliant on um, our imports. We do need to back local R&D. A fractured world does not support technology transfer that we have become used to over the last 30 years. And we do need to coordinate. We do need to coordinate, especially on being green. That includes bringing everyone along because that's that, that nationwide picture that we can present to the world. It does mean finding supply chain efficiencies and industry efficiencies on pre-competitive elements of the sustainability story. And it do, that does mean we should learn from others. We should lo look over the ditch and see how policy and frameworks have been developed and the importance of being ahead of the game and leading the conversation rather than waiting for it to happen to us. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank, thank you so much. We're going to come back to uh, a chat straight after lunch, but the point you were making there, uh, Dr. Kalish Gordon, about the challenges, highlighting the opportunities, I think was so pertinent, and I can't wait to talk to you more about that. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Cl Cheryl, Cheryl Kalish Gordon is Head of Strategy at Rabobank ANZ. Please give her a round of applause. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a great lunch and uh, enjoyed getting to hear from uh, Nola and Merrill as part of their, their friendship uh, of the primary uh, sector. And it's good to be back now, continuing on this conversation, where I'm really thrilled to welcome back Dr. Cheryl Kalish Gordon, Head of Strategy at, at Rabo Bank, who's an economist who's made a career supporting decisions making decision making in the food agriculture and the national resources sector. Uh, and also joining us is Jeremy Griffiths, whose role includes managing APAL's government re relations, also works closely with growers throughout Australia to advocate their priorities to government, including ministers, members of parliament, advisors, government agencies and industry associations, who, fun fact, actually was part of the team that built this very building and was just telling us about some of the uh, quirkier sides uh, behind the scenes here before being uh, coming back as an advisor a decade or so later and now joining us on the panel. Please make them both welcome. Uh, Cheryl, I want to start with you. You painted a pretty uh, dire picture of how volatile the state of, of the world is right now that most of us are aware of, but the granular detail really uh, quite struck me. How long do you reckon it'll take before some of these major disruptions start to level out, or is this just what we have to deal with now? Look, I think the, the main message I want to leave you with is that this is something that we need to be prepared to deal with going forward. Um, we will settle down, we will have some adjustment to the new ways of the world operating and who we trade with and how we see um, relations with each other and understand more the variability in, in production. Um, but all that is to say that that just sits within a higher um, or, or a greater risk threshold. It's sort of like there are more po um, hot holes in the road now that mean we can elevate into risk territory more quickly and that they are less easily resolved when we have deglobalisation. So if you have any sort of issue with another partner or you need to um, strengthen trade relations, if you're not talking and you're not and it's being used as a weapon, the process of resolving that becomes longer. So more often we will will we see volatile events, um, certainly at a higher cost structure, um, and that they will be more protracted over time. So it is what we think is the new norm. Mm. Uh, Jeremy, what, what do you think when you hear about that, the, the new norm about how we navigate challenges, uh, the impact they have to the sectors that we're all involved in here, and also the kind of some of those supply chain issues as well? Uh, yeah, I think um, the apple and pear industry is quite a good example, as in a very domestically focused industry. It's pretty typical of across a, a lot of agriculture sectors, across the horticulture sectors, and it really is whether the, the rubber hits the road, what actually happens on the growers. And so it's a very small industry, uh, very geographically located in, in all the states. And so just, I mean, the first thing that cab that fell off is that this is an industry that's highly reliant on, on foreign labour, like uh, the backpackers, the seasonal worker programs, so COVID, that was the first issue to come through, which is, um, I think we went from something like 150,000 backpackers down to about 30,000 in a very short period of time. Seasonal worker program was kicking around about 14,000, that fell off. Uh, it's only in the last couple of months that we're starting to see kind of labour coming back into the country. So that, that was a huge challenge to start with. And then to throw in the other issues, which is just, I said, the 101 stuff, stuff that everybody absolutely knows, but the reality is, you know, when they're starting to, you don't have labour, when your fuel costs, your transport costs go up dramatically. Um, you know, at the last federal budget was the first time that I've, I can, I've done federal budgets for almost 30 years now. And this was the first time I've actually had people phoning me actually been following the budget going I can't afford electricity prices like that I'm paying fifteen thousand dollars a month already on electricity for coolers it's for and if you're telling me those numbers are going up to thirty thousand I don't have thirty thousand dollars to pay and and the other challenge when you're a domestic agricultural sector without major exports because you know we have a very high cost base because labor can make up to you know between thirty and sixty percent of our total costs um, you're very reliant on a domestic market. And when you've got major retailers like Coles and Woolworths saying, hey, we're going to put a price freeze on, um, and then they write to the, to the, to the supplier saying, hey, guys, uh, you might have price increases, but that's fine. We may not accept those price increases. It makes it very difficult for the growers to get a, their cost of production. So it's one thing to have a highly inflationary environment, 
it's a very different thing when you've got a highly inflationary environment and you cannot literally pass on your prices. So it's, it's been a massive, massive cha challenge. And then you throw in the, the other events with the, the hail and, and the floods over the last uh, uh, period. It's, a, it's an extraordinary period of time for, for the growers and uh, very much exposed to kind of factors well and truly outside. They're, they're used to weather conditions, but there are a few things that just... Uh, just very left field, which is very hard to deal with. Well, we have this confluence of factors that, that we heard from earlier from Fiona of the, the, the trifecta, if you will, around COVID, uh, particularly COVID and conflict there. What do you think we've learned from the, the biggest black swan event we've had recently of COVID-19 and how th that can inform going forward? Cheryl, I'll start with you. Um, the biggest lesson I have from COVID is how fundamentally important our sector is. We haven't gone by the wayside, we've had challenges, but fundamentally everybody has got a new appreciation for food. I think that's a really critical part of um, the, the COVID lesson. Um, I do think it has prepped us somewhat for thinking about Australia and what happens when we are isolated. And I think if in context of what I've said today, that is something that we do need to think about more as supply chains get disrupted. How do we cope? Is having three weeks uh, worth of uh, fuel supply enough? Do you have a sense of how, mu how much is enough when we talk about th that volume of supply that we keep on shore? Because there's a big conversation happening right now around a, a gas reserve or whether there is a requirement for a gas reserve as well? Look, I think that it comes down to the fundamental risk-reward yep. discussion, okay? We can have higher costs on average because we take the peaks and the troughs or we can have higher certain costs because we onshore more. Um, you know, there will be people um, more into it than me that will think about what volume is required um, to, to provide a... a, a a sense of reserve that is greater than three weeks and can get us through critical periods. Um, but again, it's a risk reward and we're just saying now that risks are higher. So you've got to look at, uh, at greater rewards to offset that and how do you manage those? Yeah, uh, Jeremy, we've had the, uh, hi the risks highlighted through COVID-19, through emergence, the r seemingly rolling emergencies that you touched on a moment ago. What's that taught us about how we navigate black swan events in Australia? Uh, it, it was inter uh, firstly, I don't think we think about them nearly enough. Um, and I think the first, it was interesting that on the COVID, the one of the first questions that came on, oh, how much food do we have? You know, that idea that we didn't, oh, it's okay, we're fine. I remember the National Farmers Federation got out very much and put the ads, don't worry, we, we've got food. Uh, and that was a, very, a huge insight. And then I think the next debate coming through about how much fuel, I think people were quite horrified, the fact that we had three weeks of fuel uh, reserve. And then how completely reliant, all of a sudden how completely reliant we were on um, uh, labour, foreign labour, to, to actually pick the, the orchards. And I think, uh, you know, unfortunately we didn't do any, uh, nearly enough planning during that process. And I think it's a bit of a, a shock now. Uh, I, I'm concerned going forward that we will forget these things very quickly or we'll actually do the numbers of what it'll cost us to, to address those issues and we won't like the bill and we won't go there. But we'll just kind of put our head back in the sand and pretend it won't happen. I'm keen to open up to uh, any questions from the audience. If anyone has got a burning question that they can ask Jeremy or, or Cheryl here, uh, particularly around that supply chain about the opportunities. Uh, is there anyone with a burning question there? Just up here, we'll just get a microphone up to you. You just hold on. And if you can just let us know uh, your name when you, when you start questions, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Tony York, uh, NFF board, farmer from Western Australia. Just a, a banker's question, perhaps, about risk. And you've um, my uh, background knowledge says the higher the risk, the higher the... Uh, price and in terms of banking, the more you pay in interest. So why can't we assume that globally, the higher the risks in food production, the higher the net value of food across the board is going to be and that will be compensated by a, the high risk with a higher price. And I'd also just point out that in the developed world, um, food as a percentage of uh, gross uh, per capita income is only about 8 to 10%. If you're in an undeveloped world, it might be 20, 30, 40% of the per capita income. Are the days of low um, 
uh, low food costs relative to per capita income gone, and we're just going to see that percentage go back up. And we'll be fine in the end because it'll be priced in in terms of income. Hi, Tony. Um, look, I, I think that there's absolutely an adjustment period to what you're saying. Ultimately, world markets will need to adjust to account for higher risk, higher cost of sustainability, higher stocks, a higher cost structure. But on the way there, there will be potential for a mismatch between costs of production and the pricing as we have overshoots and undershoots. And so that's part of that rocky period out to 2030 when you might expect you could see some sort of adjustment might happen over that period. Um, but yeah, absolutely, you ultimately have to adjust, but there's an adjustment period. And that will be to the detriment of some regions who, can't, who have um, are particularly margin pressed in that time. Um, look, I, I totally agree. I mean, I'll, I'll put everything through the lens for, through, through the industry I work in. Apples and pears are extraordinarily cheap. There's no question about that. But you think from a high risk profile, uh, it wouldn't justify the return on your investment. And th that's, that's going to be a massive challenge. You know? And what we've seen over the last three years has dramatically increased the risk profile of being an agricultural grower in, in this country. And if you can't get the returns, uh, it's, you know, or the prices to re re kind of cover those uh, the investments, it's going to be a major issue. We've got another question. I see a hand up over there. No? There's just one down the front here. We'll just get that microphone to you. Hi, Sarah from Farmers Business Network. Um, I just have a question for you both. In During COVID, there was a feel <coughs> across the globe of deglobalisation. Do you feel that's a trend that's going to occur, yes or no? Um, and why, and also in regards to um, developing new friends, Cheryl, which you mentioned in your speech, who are they? Where do you think they will come from? Um, as per my presentation, I absolutely think that this is a, a trajectory of deglobalisation, and mostly because the status quo that we have become used to um, is being challenged by the second largest economy in the world. Um, let's take a step back to why this past 30 years has been quite manageable and lower risk. And it's because we have entered a period where we were basing the whole world order and the, the ideas behind trade on comparative advantage. One of the things about comparative advantage is that it really is um, prefaced on gains for all but it also has a couple of lesser talked about assumptions that sit behind them. One is that it's a risk-free environment. Two is that there's no major dominance of market power. And um, thirdly, there are no externalities. I think in my presentation this morning, I outlined where we're sitting and highlighted the fact that all those three things are present now. So it challenges the basic premise of that global economic um, order that we have had. Um, in terms of our friends, it's got to be, if we're looking for a lower risk path into the future, which I think is where we're going to have to onshore risk now, that we're going to have to take that into control. It's about playing with the people that ultimately won't use trade as a weapon against us. And so that is the people that we will be sitting in um, the alliances we've talked about, whether that's um, NATO, Friends, AUKUS, um, the Quad. Can I just pick up on one part that Sarah mentioned there around deglobalizing? Where does that fit in the broader discussion around sustainability and something that keeps coming up is, is decarbonising as well? Oh, this is the bit that I would have talked to um, had we had longer this morning and um, it's not a nice part to talk about because it's, it's, it's a bit depressing. Um, if you think about the global trends of deglobalisation and destabilisation of the environment plus decarbonisation, there's an intractable relationship between them. For decarbonisation to occur you need to be globalised and cooperating. If we don't decarbonise, destabilisation gets worse. 
if destabilisation gets worse, the factors that drive us apart, the factors that um, bring us to push comes to shove moments, i.e. where are the resources, where is the food, increase. And so there's an interlinkage between them. So if we do, the more we deglobalize, the more intractable this problem is globally. And I guess the other sign of that is is cooperation, the key. And but what else needs to happen for that to work effectively? Because we see global meetings uh, like the COP twenty seven. In fact, we saw the leader of Barbados saying we simply have to do better now. This is about choices that we need to all individually make as well as collectively. Oh, look, I think that we need to recognise every single agent in the world that this is not a costless transi transition. I think people do talk about becoming more sustainable and thinking that this is just something we do and that we can um, continue on our merry way regardless. But the reality is sustainability is internalising externalities. Like it's taking something we haven't paid for, whether that's biodiversity, whether that's carbon, whether it's uh, water quality, and we're internalising the cost or we're making it more expensive. So you're actually um, in a situation where we do need to be prepared to pay more to the point about food, we do need to be prepared to pay more for it because this isn't a costless transaction. So I think that's the number one. And, you know, I think the, the context of COP, COP27 was all about thinking about the disproportionate impacts around the world. And I think that is a good first step. I'm not sure that um, damages is the right way to go. Mitigation is probably and um, supporting other countries to skip the industrialisation process to move ahead is, is a better way, but um, that's, that's on the track. But, you know, there's a lot of planning at the moment, but hitting the rubber to the road on, on real change it has to happen soon. Mm. Hey, Jeremy, do you want I to was just going to comment. I think deglobalisation is a new word for kind of the um, Cold War, is it not? <laughs> And like it's going to be, it's going to be a massive impact to the whole supply chains. If you think at the back of the Cold War, it just there was two separate supply chains, and, and and that's a challenge. And energy, unfortunately, low cost energy becomes a major, major weapon in the Cold War. It has always, and so it's going to be a huge challenge. So, so what do you see then as as the opportunity? Is it around what Cheryl was talking about in the presentation, diversifying markets, and and I guess that then goes some way to spreading risk, doesn't it? Diversification. I also think the, the massive integration of the supply chains, as much as we started this deep globalisation going forward, I think a few people are kind of waking up going, oh, this isn't going to be as easy as what, and, you know, that we're still heavily reliant upon China. You know, China's trade with America is in their interest and America's trade in China's interest, and hopefully there'll be more same heads to thinking you know, a bit of a deep breath and maybe we can move on a little bit because I think there was quite a few economic theories a while back to say that we would never get to this point because our whole supply chains were so massively integrated that we didn't have the luxury of pulling them apart. And I think as we pull them apart, we're discovering it's a very, very expensive pastime. Yeah, maybe those cooler heads in a couple of the uh, global forums there. Do we have any other questions from anyone in the audience? Yep, we'll just get a microphone to you first. Uh, uh, John Baker from AgForce. Um, Cheryl, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on ESG and you were talking about sustainability and greening or you know, making sure we're green, our product is green. Um, wh what, you, what are you seeing, of the, where are the forces or the, the driving forces for ESG and, and um, how as producers we might deal with that and um, you know, what's the way forward, do you think? Uh, so the forces are, are multi-level. Um, I think that if you look um, uh, globally in terms of any of the key supply chains for our ag products, they are making commitments to ESG. Um, and that therefore flows down. Um, and that becomes the baseline then for all of the supply chains. And if you take, I mean, ESG is very broad, but if you do take just um, the, the, the carbon element of that and we look at the commitments that are being made by um, manufacturers and traders globally to uh, carbon reductions and um, net, net zero, um, they're being very ambitious. Now, that's kind of easy for them when 
about 70% of those global supply chains carbon um, is scope three. So they can do a lot quite quickly with their scope one and maybe scope two. They can put solar panels on the roofs. They can stop flights for executives and, and minimise that. But those commitments, which, by the way, are becoming more um, scientific and measured in the process through registers such as SBTI um, globally, means that then they get to a certain point, they've done that basic minimum, where do they look next? They look to what they're buying. And so, therefore, it's a flow-on throughout um, the, the supply chain. Right now, I don't think we're seeing um, sufficient signals at the farm gate to encourage um, progress here. Um, in other parts of the world um, and even across the ditch, it's a regulated, regulated process that's so they've got market signals plus, uh, you know, sticks as well. So it's a mix of both, um, but absolutely the, the drive from the consumer that has been picked up by um, manufacturers and being picked up by traders then has flow on impacts for what they will buy. Look, we have uh, come right to the end of the clock. I just want to ask you a final question to both of you. We, we've been hearing today about the 2030 roadmap and about this conversation of where how to get there over the next uh, couple of eight years or so. What are the risks and the opportunities that you see from your sectors about getting to that point? Jeremy, I'll start with you. Um, look, uh, again, from a very domestically focused industry, one of the biggest challenges, and we're talking about this black swans, things haven't already appeared. Um, so, but I, I do think we have lived in, in, with a threat of major biosecurity threats for a long time, and I think at the moment we're just waiting, unfortunately, uh, and uh, for um, like in addition to, to some of the issues like brown marmorated stink bug, if that ever became endemic in, this, in the horticultural sector, would have a massive impact, uh, for example. I, I think that's a big risk to, to our industry, but at the same time, the opportunity is to how do we manage that? How do we manage our biosecurity? Because that will be quite a marketable difference going forward because you know, the benchmarks have been sent all around the world. We have to comply, we have to match it. We have a great story in Australia, um, dare I say, it, a horticultural sector, the apple and pears are some of the most sustainable products in the world from a carbon footprint point of view, and it's something, you know, there's an opportunity for us in that area. Yeah, Cheryl? Um, to choose just one. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, was that easy? Um, uh, potentially to, to also speak to borders, um, the tyranny of distance. Um, that we are a nation that is potentially going to be far from some of the markets that will be most friendly to us, um, and the fact that we are input exposed to the world. So imported um, inputs, um, we're highly exposed. So I think um, that is something that concerns me and, and means that when we're thinking about a $100 billion target, that's great, but if that's at a half a percent profit margin, that's not what we want to be seeing. So managing that input um, story is going to be critical. And, and in terms of opportunity, if we can onshore any small part of that um, supply chain of inputs in a green way, try, you know, that's the bonanza, that's yeah. the opportunity. Look, th thank you both so much for your time, Dr. Cheryl Kalish-Gordon from Rubber Bank and Jeremy Griffith from APAL. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking them both. Thank you.